Good evening, uh, good afternoon, or whatever time zone you are in. I want to welcome you to our debate and discussion on the situation in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, it's an urgent issue as such that uh, on this very day, when we see a full-scale operation and occupation of uh, Ukraine by Russia, one could, of course, uh, ask, are there not more important issues? On the other hand, I would say no, Bosnia-Herzegovina stays important and could even be more important. I had uh, the possibility this morning already to join a discussion here in Vienna at the University Forum uh, between Kosovo, Serb, Kosovo Albanians and Serb representatives. And also there already was the feeling that in this very fragile time, it is especially important for a new and strengthened engagement in Bosnia Herzegovina and the whole region, of course, Kosovo, because we don't know what kind of overspill that could happen between what happens in the Ukraine and what happens in the Balkans. Already in the past weeks, we saw, especially with uh, Mr. Dodik from the Republic of Srpska, activities we would not like to see, endangering the unity of the country, of the cohesion of the country, and endangering, of course, the whole Balkan situation. So IIB, again, is organizing this event. Uh, this is not only one event uh, only, but it is uh, a restart, so to say, of our activities on the Western Balkans. We will continue in the coming months here in Vienna, but probably also in Belgrade and in other places, because for us, uh, this region is uh, our neighborhood, and we have to care for our neighborhood. With this short introduction, I want to hand over the microphone to Luka Cekic. He will uh, moderate this discussion, and I hope you find it interesting, and again, uh, welcome, and uh, I hope you will be engaged with us in the future weeks and months on the Western Balkan issue. Luka, you have the mic. Thank you very much, Hannes. <coughs> I would like to welcome all our guests and our panelists, also here at the Institute, but also online. Hello to everybody of you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Luka Cekic. I will be moderating today's event, which is called Bosnia and Herzegovina's <coughs> Political Crisis. Are words going to stay the only weapon? Considering also what happened today in Ukraine, one can only raise awareness of the great danger of war, which is still in Europe as a threat. I would actually start by introducing, first of all, the panelists. Uh, the first one I would introduce is uh, Mrs. Delara Bukhat. She is an MEP and the Vice Chair of the Delegation for Relations for Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Um, Adnan Cerimagic, Senior Analyst at the European Stability Initiative in Berlin. Alida Vracic, she is a political scientist and both co-founder and Executive Director of Populari, a think tank based in Bosnia, specializing in the European integration of Western Balkans. Vedran Žikic, senior researcher at the OIP and lecturer at the University of Vienna. And Alice Lojic, a political scientist at the University of Vienna. So first of all, it has been 26 years since the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed, which ended the war and laid the foundations of the constitutional and institutional architecture of the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina, consisting of two entities, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Republika Srpska. Today, the country not only still faces enormous challenges, but is also going through one of the biggest political crises. Corruption is widespread, ethno-nationalism ethno is rising and influences the educational system and political system on a larger scale. Infrastructure is lacking, economy is weak, and the health system, healthcare system is insufficient. Talking about the pollution, the pollution is, it is actually one of the most polluted regions in Europe. So, because we are talking about the political crisis, I would first address how it began. It began actually in July last year when Valint uh, Valentin Insko, the high representative, banned genocide denial and established war crimes, as well as the glorification of war criminals. The Serb representatives responded by boycotting uh, central institutions. 
Milorad Dodik, the Serb member of Bosnia's tripartite presidency, announced last year that the country's Serb-run entity, Republika Srpska, will quit key state institutions to achieve full autonomy within the country in violation of the 1995 peace accords. Milorad Dodik, the strongman of Republika Srpska, is threatening to re-establish their own army, intelligence service, and tax unit, declaring state-level institutions illegal. This would lead to de facto secession of Republika Srpska and collapse of legal and institutional architecture of Bosnia and Herzegovina that has been developed since 1995. When he was asked how he will do it, he referred to how the Slovenes did it in 1992, meaning as referring to the use of violence during the breakup of the Yugoslav state. Last month, in December 20, uh, basically two months ago, in December 21, the parliament of Republika Srpska passed a series of laws enabling the entity to form its own parastatal institutions and its own army by May this year. Although the office of the high representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina has the power to remove any politician who violates the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the current high representative, Christian Schmidt, has so far avoided doing so, even though Dodik has repeatedly broken the law. So we basically gathered here to discuss this crisis and to see how it will develop in the future. I would like to start and to give every of, our, uh, every of our panelists approximately 10 minutes for their opening statements, and I would like to start with Mrs. Delara Bukhat. So please. Thank you so much, and what an honor to start this uh, really amazing and interesting panel. So let me start with a personal remark. Um, I was born 1992. Uh, I was three years old when the Dayton Agreement was um, signed. So this situation we are seeing now with the war in Ukraine, with the growing tensions in the Western Balkan, is something that never has been on my, since I'm having a political awareness been on the agenda that the, pers the possibilities or the actual happening of war is there with my political consciousness. So I must say that um, I really am really worried about what we are seeing, but on the same time, I think it's so crucial that we discuss the, the, the situation in Bosnia Herzegovina on a day like today, um, because what I feel really obliged to as as a as a European, not only as a member of the European Parliament, is that I believe and I'm convinced that it's the European Union who is in charge to support the territorial integrity of Bosnia Herzegovina without a doubt. There had been 26 years of peace after a devastating war, a cruel war between humans who now live together as neighbors, as one country. And I think this is what, what we have to preserve. This, this peace is the framework on which we have to build. And as European Union, I, I think we have to fight um, against everyone and everything that will divide the Bosnian people. So um, as you mentioned in your introductory, we are facing tremendous ethno-nationalistic moves in in especially the Republika Srpska. But why are we facing them? I think that Milorad Dodik is a key actor. He was triggered by the decision you mentioned of the high representative of Bosnia Herzegovina, Valentin Insko, at the end of July to punish the denial, uh, denial of genocide, war crimes and against humanity. And Dodik, since then, keeps pushing people and politicians of Republika Srpska to blockade state institution from general Bosnia-Herzegovina. Since then, we see a worsening of the situation. And instead of the, the strong man of Republika Srpska focusing on cooperation and agreement, his successionist and provoking rhetoric is on the rise. He is not just talking about his plans, but he threatens to turn this rhetoric into action. That is quite shocking and sets how alarming the situation is for the peace in the country. So we saw a new escalation on the 9th of January this year, just about one and a half months ago, where Dodik celebrated the day of Republika Srpska, which is banned by the Supreme Court of 
Bosnia-Herzegovina with a military parade. It is banned because it is, starting, it is the starting point for the beginning of the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina in 92 and supports ethnic nationalism. I don't have to tell you that. But it was also that day where we saw a glorification of, um, of Radko Mladic um, of Radu, uh, Radu Maladic, sorry for the pronunciation of Radu, uh, and uh, the provocations of intimidation of Bosniaks in, in several cities um, of Republika Srpska, which we saw. And so what I'm convinced of, and what is the, the European Union's um, responsibility now, is to stop acting quietly, and we have to speak up. It is now most important that we strengthen the direct link also to the civil society, and we must show solidarity with this democratic partners in Bosnia-Herzegovina by imposing, and this is why what I have been very clear on um, in, in my political work, uh, by opposing sanctions on the actors around and directly to Dodik by strengthening also the office of the high representative of Bosnia-Herzegovina and by supporting those who want to improve the country and not those who want to create difference and take political power out of it. This is what I'm convinced of. I want Europe to not be quiet anymore, to not look away when it comes about the situation in Western Balkans, in Bosnia-Herzegovina specifically, and I want us to act and be vocal, and I'm looking forward to the discussion we are having on this tonight. Thank you very much, Mrs. Burkhardt, for this <coughs> presentation. I would like to continue with Vedran Žihic. Um, Vedran, how do you perceive the current crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina and how do you actually see the role of the European Union when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina and also maybe to Austria? How are they dealing with the crisis? Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation and it's, it's good, uh, good to uh, speak uh, uh, on this very day. Uh, before I come to Bosnia, I mean, just one or two sentences on, on, on what we are facing right now. I mean, Alida uh, will probably feel the same because both of us went through the war in Bosnia in, in, in 1992, and uh, it was our leaders back then, uh, president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, telling us, like Zelensky was telling to the Ukrainian population a few days ago, that they can sleep, uh, well, uh, and that the war is not going to happen, and the war happened, and we know what the war means. Uh, I mean, we see here, uh, First of all, uh, a beginning of huge pain and sorrow that is going to hit not only Ukraine, but also Russia uh, uh, and, uh, and Europe. Uh, this is the end of, certainly, most certainly, the end of, 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 of what we were used to live in uh, since 1989, 1990. These are totally new circumstances. I think it is the end of the liberal global democratic order as we knew it. Uh, it might be that the West can uh, uh, step up and, and protect uh, this order, but it will be not on a global scale, that's for sure. Uh, and there is a kind of a new paradigm that came in here. This is the military power. This is the uh, strength of those that are more powerful than the others. And this is a brutal violation of, of what we know. Uh, and this is probably one of the, of the darkest moments since 1945. Yet, uh, and given, given the experience that Alida and I and many of us from Bosnia have of the war in the 90s, uh, I think it's now uh, time to speak up and be quite, uh, quite straightforward. First of all, and, and, and to come to Bosnia. Uh, the, uh, what we see here behind Russia's argumentation, and Putin's argumentation, is something similar that we can see uh, uh, in Dodik's worldview. It is revisionist. Uh, it is trying to rewrite history according to a script that only uh, he knows. Uh, it is authoritarian. Uh, it is a total different type of governance that they promote. And it is, in the end, uh, a clientelistic, corrupt, but also criminal a uh, bunch of people that are ready to sacrifice uh, uh, its pop their population, basically, for, for some other sake. I mean, what Putin is doing right now in Russia, I mean, he is sacrificing millions of Russian. I mean, now right now, Russian soldiers, 18, 19, 20 years old, are being killed, uh, as well as the Ukrainian civilians and, and soldiers. Uh, the civilian situation is going to suffer terribly. Uh, all of us in Europe will probably suffer. I mean, all of those that are deprived, uh, that are uh, living right now also in poverty, the inequalities will deepen, we will fight inflation, etc., etc. But what we have here is really, I mean, and, and just to underline it once again, and this is the strongest parallel that you can draw, uh, Dodik, Putin, 
that's the same type of leadership, that's the same type of approach to sorting out certain issues, uh, and that is utterly dangerous. Now, obviously, Dodik uh, is a bit smaller than Putin, and luckily, uh, but we have to be pretty clear, uh, and just to come back to your statement at the beginning, not the uh, INSCO's uh, law on the genocide denial started this off. I mean, this is a, a, this is a mistake, this is a narrative that we should not buy in. But Valentin INSCO did was something that was, from my point of view at least, that should have happened much earlier. Uh, the point is that here Dodik and his clique, uh, uh, this kleptocratic clientelistic criminal clique, has basically uh, uh, taken the country as a hostage and uh, not only since this law, but uh, for a while. Uh, and, and this is a kind of a series of, of direct attacks on the sovereignty of the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, trying to uh, hide with that kind of a type of a nationalist rhetorics, uh, trying to hide uh, and uh, all the problems that basically his government has caused on the people of the Republic of Srpska during the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And this is explicitly, and this has been backed up by Russia. I mean, this is quite uh, obvious. Uh, just two days ago, before the, 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 the massive invasion and aggression started, uh, Dodik appeared on, on, on TVs uh, uh, in uh, Republic of Srpska, uh, uh, there was a book presentation of some author and the Russian ambassador joined him, gave a speech, uh, Russian ambassador for celebrating, basically cherishing Putin's approach, etc., etc. Uh, now we have first voices, I just uh, checked up on the internet, uh, Sergej Mazalica, who is one of the members of the Serbian, uh, of, of the party of Milorad Dodik, just uh, uh, basically said that he supports Russia, that this is the right way to go, and that this action was basically needed in order to draw a line and to tell the West, which is one of the myths that we have in the Western Balkans, to tell the West that it needs to stop. So this is the same narrative that, that Dodik uh, is using. And I see uh, now coming back basically for the, to the issue and what the EU should do, is supposed to do. Uh, I think there are two scenarios. Uh, Vucic and, 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 and the inner circle is still contemplating right now how to respond, and this is also a shame, so that we, I mean, right now we don't have a clear, straightforward response by uh, Serbian regime. Uh, we know that there is a huge support for Russia and for Putin. There were even celebrations today in northern Mitrovica and some other cities. We know that Serbian tabloids the last few days have massively run a pro-Russian campaign. Uh, uh, and, and also in TV shows, so that's quite dangerous. And now we have uh, two scenarios. The first one is uh, the Western Balkans descending into some, into some kind of a chaos, uh, not a direct military conflict, but uh, an unfortunate scenario uh, close to some of the scenarios that we uh, have been observing the last few months in the, in the Ukraine. Uh, that will be of enormous danger uh, for the peace and for the security in the Western Balkans, and I, I do hope that this is not going to happen. The second one uh, is the one that I hope for. I mean, that uh, will include a strong as possible uh, unity on the side of the European Union. I mean, there are a few encouraging steps. The 27 are going to impose sanctions. The NATO has activating the acts. Uh, uh, there is a strong condemnation of the attack on, 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 on Ukraine. Uh, and there are also first signs that the West and the EU is ready to step up at least First signs, uh, its presence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 500 additional soldiers of the OIFO troops uh, were, are going to be uh, placed in Bosnia. Uh, we also heard like interesting voices from the former Secretary of, of Europe, uh, State Secretary in Germany, Michael Roth, calling up the European Union right now to uh, stop this, all what we have been seeing the, like, the last few years, stabilitocracy, promising not delivering, uh, uh, losing up on the, on, on the, on the EU enlargement. Uh, I mean, he called for the European Union to immediately start negotiations with, uh, uh, with North Macedonia and Albania to kickstart the process of the enlargement, uh, to show the presence, uh, to send soldiers if, ne if necessary to Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and to stop uh, basically threatening and voicing a huge danger and concern uh, and start acting. And that would, in my case, uh, obviously include uh, a following up on what the declaration of the European Parliament uh, did I think that was a very powerful sign from the European Parliament uh, to go with such a huge uh, resolution uh, regarding Dodik, 
uh, and calling from sections, I, I think uh, that has to be next step because Dodik is not going to be able to position himself against Russia. He will continue uh, be, to be backed up also by, by Putin directly and partly by some parts of the regime in Belgrade. Uh, so now it's time for the West to show unity, to say that the Western Balkans is the Western security uh, interest zone, to stand up for the values, and if the West, if the EU and the US miss this chance, I think we will see uh, horrible scenarios developing in the Western Balkans too, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Vedran. So I would like to continue to um, Alida. Um, Alida, as uh, you have been the director of Populari and have been working on the region so far, I would also like to hear your opening statement and maybe also a bit to focus on um, just a second, to focus on the connection between the current crisis which is happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the failure of politicians to govern the country. Because if I remember co correctly, you gave an interview to The Guardian where you said that the perpetual and worsening sense of the crisis allows the country's leader to disguise their failure to govern. So if you could maybe also explain a bit this. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I apologize in advance. I will have to leave you 10 minutes before 7 because I have another call also related to Bosnia. Um, let me first reflect on what Vedran has said. Uh, absolutely. It, it hits very, very close to home. This morning, what we have seen, I mean, just glued me to my computer and my phone. I, just, I talked to my friends in Ukraine trying to um, get some sense how they feel. And it really, really reminds of early 90s when we all felt, you know, in solidarity, when we sang all these songs, when we had these concerts, when we were hoping that West will come and save us. And this is more or less how they feel now. They keep on telling me, telling me how brave they are and how strong they are and how everything is going to be fine. And at the same time, it's me on the other end asking them whether they have their passports, whether they have their cars, where's the, where's the closest border? Because my mind thinks completely differently, you know, with, with 30 years different, with 30 years distance. And it's horrible what's happening. And I draw some parallels, but um, let, let, let's not make projections of what, where, where Ukraine is going at the moment. I'm hoping for the best, but I'm expecting the worst. Um, as for, the, for Bosnia, I mean, I've been, as you said, I have given lots of interviews and I've discussed Bosnia in the past couple of months with all sorts of people from the US to European capitals, uh, trying to figure out you know, what, where exactly it went wrong and what can be done and what are the concrete pragmatic solutions for Bosnia. Uh, we have seen some sanctions uh, happening, but uh, those sanctions are nowhere near to what we're, we were supposed to be seeing after all these meetings, after all these conferences, after all these sort of urgencies that Bosnia attracted in the past couple of months. I personally think that if you have a person or an entity or an organization threatening peace, putting at risk peace that has been built for 30 years, no sanction is, is you know, uh, uh, no sanction is, is out of question. And this is, this is where I stand uh, basically on that. As for the crisis itself, how it started, I mean, uh, Luca, you have given a genesis, more or less, how it started in July when the law, the actually an amendment to the law has been imposed. But I would say actually that the crisis has been brewing in Bosnia for many months, even years, because Bosnia is counted. I mean, our time in Bosnia is calculated from one crisis to another. And there are people in Bosnia of my age also calculating time by before the war and after the war. You know, this is this is a crazy sort of uh, way of thinking that 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 we contemplate uh, when we discuss our own country. So basically, while yes, absolutely, I mean, it was triggered by one event. I think it has been brewing for many, many, many months and years. I mean, state institutions have been weakened. Uh, specifically and intentionally for many years, uh, I would even say from 2009, 2010 on. Uh, and then, I mean, in these 30 years or 26 years, the fact that we have to admit and acknowledge to ourselves that there are different ideas what Bosnia should be like within Bosnia. You clearly have people in Bosnia thinking that maybe Republika Srpska should be a separate entity on its own. And this is where the secession story comes in. In the recent weeks and, and even months, we have seen also that Croats also very vividly play with an idea of a third entity. This is no secret there. 
And then you have Bosniaks preserving, trying to preserve what they think they, they have. So these three sort of scenarios, at least three, but I would imagine there are more scenarios and more different versions of what one country should look like. They have basically have been, have been uh, uh, um, constructed by different leaderships and given people as, as given, I mean, as, as, a, as a framework. So within 30 years, we have given a framework that has been reduced to nations, entities, cantons your own threats without any 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 vision for opportunities without any vision for modern without any vision for liberal without any vision for becoming part of european and that is visible everywhere you look at if you look at the economic situation i mean there are people that are working only specifically on this even if we start tomorrow in order to converge with the european standards it will take 100 years for us I mean, not only Bosnia and Herzegovina, but for the rest of the Balkans. If you look at the state institutions, uh, and this is also where the international community comes in, because they are also part of this story. I mean, not a single institution in Bosnia and Herzegovina has been uh, sort of built up and constructed without an involvement of the institutional in the international community. So one really wonders how it's possible that we have invested 26 years into, into judiciary, and we wake up one day and realize that judiciary doesn't work and it's corrupt and nobody really trusts judiciary in this country. So it's, it's what I'm trying to say is that it's not necessarily to, down to one event and it's not necessarily down to one, one person. Although we, we, all, we all refer to Milorad Dodik as, as the one, and I also think he's the, the most vocal. But it seems that the disintegration has been brewing for a long, long, long time. So what's the starting point? I mean, how one actually deals with this? Um, go, going back to, to um, what we have discussed, what, we, what you said about my interview, I think it's also part of the crisis in Bosnia are largely due to the fact that, you know, there is no delivery. I mean, if you look at the Bosnian leadership and if you look at their actual achievements, and I'm not talking necessarily about the, 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 their circles and, 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 and some other uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, individuals that are actually doing some great work, but the leadership itself, they really didn't deliver. And especially in the last couple of years when we were badly hit by a COVID crisis, I mean, you could have seen it anywhere, frauds, embezzlements, uh, you know, uh, people, the prime minister of federation being uh, currently on the trial, like all sorts of things where you would expect them to govern. They did not only they didn't govern, but they actually embezzled money on, or, or they could, they committed some, some other, some other crimes. So part of it is to derail discussion. So instead of talking about me embezzling money, let's go into another crisis that is basically about, you know, something that we have seen like, you know, many times before, because talks about secessions are not new, talks about, you know, uh, uh, Bosnia falling apart and breaking apart are also not new. I mean, I've even calculated once that in my adult lifetime, probably every single year since I was 18, Bosnia was on the brink of a new crisis. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not even sometimes easy to explain to people like, when, is it really now this time on a brink of crisis or it just, you know, like it was the past time. But I do think this, this, is, this, uh, this crisis has been really serious and I think it, it scared people. And I think everyone who scares people in Bosnia after the experiences that we have had should be punished and should be really punished harshly, not with the sanctions that we have seen like banning three companies in a TV station. I think these sanctions should come really strong. I think uh, the, the international community and the West is it should be a partner, but should be a real partner like it used to be, you know, in the, in the years that I remember in 2000, 2005, in 2006, in 2007, when it actually discussed all the possibilities with, with, uh, with those progressive forces and managed to actually make some successful achievements in Bosnia. Um, and basically offer, offer a somewhat different framework, offer, offer you know, a, a, a top-notch education, offer a modern uh, facilities for the hospitals, offer different notions what Bosnia could look like. Once you give people different expectations, then they actually, you know, steer towards these expectations. I'm afraid that people have been given very limited choices and they, in 30 years time, they have learned how to think in all these very reduced sort of, you know, like, like aspects of life. 
instead of striving for and, and, and striving for something else and, and thriving in, in this process. And this is why you have result of migration and that many people leaving. And we know the numbers are horrific. I don't even want to um, start about numbers, but this is the consequence of that. Big, big, where you have people at the crest boardings saying basically that Bosnia is not a country for young people. This is where the, all discussions end. Unless you create a, an environment for these people, they won't stay. They will go elsewhere. They will join the West instead of deciding to, to, to actually do something and fix Bosnia one or the other way. So while I think there are many uh, different um, options on how to improve situation and how to offer people a different framework to think about their country. I also think we have to acknowledge that not everyone sees sees Bosnia the same, and this is the fact. So instead of talking about, you know, uh, seceding, we should really offer I mean, when I say we, it's it's a combination of the international community. It's it's a perspective for the EU. It's NATO. It's everything that you know that that we're looking at when we switch on TV and we say, "Oh, what a beautiful city that is!" You know, be it to any city in in, in the West. So give them perspective, um, so they can actually also become that part of the world. I will stop here. Thank you very much, Alida, for your interesting input. I would like to continue with Adi. Adi, the question that I have before you start with your opening statement is maybe that you can explain to our viewers how the international influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina is and especially the role of the US, Turkey and Russia, but also the neighbors, R Serbia and Croatia, who play a huge role in the internal politics of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me and thanks to uh, to others, other speakers. Uh, tonight or today is a, is a very sad day, so I apologize if uh, at some point I lose my uh, strain of thought or if I move to, to another topic. I will come back to what's happening today and how is it linked to, to what's happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the region a bit later and hopefully Luca also uh, answer to, to, to your question. I would maybe like to start with one general point on Bosnia and Herzegovina and that is although it's difficult today to talk about it due to the situation, how much Bosnia and Herzegovina has changed since 1995, and I would say dramatically has changed. Uh, has it become a modern, prosperous, multi-ethnic state based on rule of law and market-oriented uh, economy? It hasn't. But if we go back to the 1995 that some of us do uh, remember, we would find a country divided in three almost mono-ethnic uh, entities with military, with uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers, totally destroyed, uh, without any connections to its neighbors, completely isolated of uh, Euro European projects and not integrated in them, and with poor people and uh, totally destructed uh, economy. In the meantime, and I think part of it has been addressed also by uh, Alida, a lot has uh, changed from that uh, point. Uh, today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, if you go from one entity to another, from one canton to another, from one municipality to another, in fact, except a couple symbolism, you don't see, you don't see a big uh, difference. There's no obstacle for you to travel. Uh, one out of uh, four uh, people in Bosnia and Herzegovina today live in municipality where their own ethnic group is not in majority. In Republika Srpska, that is at the center of this crisis that we're talking about, around 220,000 non-Serbs uh, live. And at the state level, as Alida said, also thanks to the support of international community, there's a forest of institutions that deal with issues from education to medicinal products, but also how milk production is ha happening in the country and how uh, milk is being exported from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And when we think about why this happened, why people returned, why there was a building of these institutions, institutions that were not just built on the paper. Today, this uh, agency for medicinal uh, products has a, its seat in Banja Luka. It has its laboratory in Sarajevo. There are 200 people working in there every day, uh, making sure that uh, that medicines that come to the market of Bosnia and Herzegovina are, to some extent, at least, uh, in accordance uh, in accordance with uh, rules. And while most people 
do think that the reason why these institutions were brought into life is linked to the OHR and imposition, and they would be right. They had a, a certain role in that. The reason why they, per, per, why they persisted and why they continued to exist and why they had a life of their own is linked to the EU in, and regional integration of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Serbs going to the Agency for Medicinal Products in Banja Luka and working in the laboratory in Sarajevo did that because they taught or they think that that is, that is going to bring something better to them, to their children and to the country they live in. The promise was we would be able to easily, more easily trade with the EU. We would be able to prosper uh, and eventually we would become uh, members of the EU. So in my opinion, what happened in the past 10 or by now even 15 years is that at the point when the EU accession process started to fade, not just for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but for its neighbors, Serbia, Montenegro and for others, a vision of Bosnia and Herzegovina and of Republika Srpska, uh, championed by Dodik and his political party, was we don't want to build more institutions. With the idea that we will never become members of the EU, that we don't see benefits of becoming members of the EU, we object creating any new institutions, we object changing any anything. And we, to be honest, we in the past 10 years, we haven't seen any major reform of institutional architecture of Bosnia-Herzegovina or public policy in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Everything has been de facto maintained uh, that existed, that was created by 2010-ish, let's say, with the visa, uh, visa-free uh, travel reforms linked to visa-free travel were actually the last point where some, some reforms were formed. But in the meantime, since the EU accession process has faded away, there, uh, the pressure from the EU to create new institutions, to reform has faded away, Dodik was left with only one vision for himself and for Republika Srpska, and that is to attack the institutions that exist at the state level and that have been built. And that is what we are, uh, we are uh, I think, seeing now. We are seeing a politician who, uh, who, uh, has, who is not challenged in a, in a great way with his vision of destructing institutions at the state level, be it judiciary, be it secret service, be it armed forces. And all of these institutions he wants for himself in Republika Srpska. He doesn't want to share them at the state level or to have just slight influence through the state level. He wants for himself to have his full control over police, to have full control over judiciary and to have full control over armed forces. And he's telling the EU, behind the closed doors, but also since recently in public, you can't do much because there is nothing that you're offering extra. And this brings me to the to today. Uh, I woke up thinking all the talks about sanctions, how much it's going to hurt Putin, how much it's going to put hurt Russian economy, how much it's going to hurt Russian citizens. All the talk of deaths and destructions in the Ukraine has not stopped the strength of the negative vision that Putin has for his military, for his forces, and for what he wants to see in the Ukraine and Europe. There was no alternative vision in Russian Federation, no alternative vision that could stop him in doing what he can. And made me think, what is the other vision in Republika Srpska, alternative vision to what Milorad Dodik is saying? And is it strong enough to, to, to prevent him? Will sang I mean, in case of Russia, we're talking about really severe sanctions. In case of Republika Srpska, we're talking about travel bans and uh, asset freezing for a couple of individuals that do not have EU membership. And that's not many uh, also in Republika Srpska and in his uh, cir circles. So do we really have we, even if we manage to push all these sanctions, even if we manage uh, to, to, to do what, what, we are what many analysts are arguing for, will we be confronted with the fact that his dark realism, that his force is much stronger than, than, the, than the bluff of EU perspective that's being uh, shared at the moment. So in a concluding remarks, uh, my appeal here, and elsewhere in the days that are going to be coming is that we really, really need to focus on having a vision 
that will capture the imagination of the citizens of Republika Srpska, but also of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of Serbia, and of rest of the rest of the uh, region. And we need to call the bluff of the EU. We would not be doing a favor to the EU by saying that if they open accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia, that it will have a domino effect where Dodik will say, oh, now you're serious about the EU accession process. So now I will stop and I will, I will, I will do uh, something else. Or if we, if we give visa-free travel to Kosovo, that, that it will change. Of course, both of the things need to happen, but we really need to seriously uh, reassess the EU accession process and offer something that is credible, that is possible for the countries of the of the Western Balkans, something that member states can agree on and something that is uh, capturing the imagination and, and political will of the citizens. In that sense, Luca, to answer to your question, all the other actors, uh, their power uh, rests in their ability to play into the vision that people like Dodi have. So just these discussions about the election law reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, uh, they're bothered, some in, in those negotiations on the Bosnia and Herzegovina side are bothered by the Venice Commission. They're bothered by European Court of Human Rights. And when you talk to them, you will understand that what they're hoping is that the EU US gives up so that they go, can go to some other actors, be it Russia, Turkey, and negotiate with them how Bosnia and Herzegovina needs to look in the next five to 10 years. And in that vision, the, their vision and the vision for Bosnia and Herzegovina and for the region in that case would be much closer to what Bedran was, was describing at uh, the, the beginning. So, and I apologize again for maybe being uh, a, bit, uh, a bit different today than, than usually, but I think really we need to do a favor to ourselves and to the EU and really start talking seriously about the EU accession process and the vision uh, for, for the Bosnia Herzegovina and for the Western Balkans. Uh, if in the meantime, we manage to uh, punish and uh, make some individuals uh, suffer, uh, it's okay, but we really need a, a real vision for the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. Now I would like to turn to Elise. So, uh, as being a young student in, in Vienna at the University of Vienna and studying political science, I would like to ask you, um, do young generations feel nostalgic about the Yugoslav times and how can one battle the problem of mass migration of the youth? The other question which I, which I would have for you is, how does the youth perceive from your point of view the current crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the rising ethnic tensions? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and for the possibility to, to talk about the perspective of the youth. Um, do we feel nostalgic about Yugoslav um, past? I think we have to differentiate here. Mm, because everything we do know about the past, we learn from our families, who themselves were affected by everything that happened or ended in a war and all the history we learned about our countries, about the last 30 years of Yugoslavia, we learned from people who were involved and affected um, at the end of the day. And depending on what our families experienced, um, that's the story we heard about Yugoslavia. And this is where it becomes dangerous. Um, so I think we, we have to encourage, firstly, to be able to tackle this problem with the glorification maybe sometimes of Yugoslavia, learn about it in school, have it more con uh, contextualized, because the title of our panel today is our words going to stay the only weapon, and words are one, one part of a narrative that, as we saw, Putin, Milora Dodik, can try to, to tell in their own way, the way it suits them. So no, I don't think that the youth is nostalgic about, about Yugoslavia. What we're nostalgic about is the unity that people tell us about was also there before the war and the unity that we don't know in this context. Mm. And how could we tackle mass migration? Um, I think we, as Alida has said already, we need to create 
perspectives and possibilities for the youth. The same way we want to have a good job, a good future, a safe future, they want to have it as well and they deserve it. It's our job and our responsibility to, to encourage all the measures that would, that would help them get there. It is no coincidence that so many people in Bosnia or in our home countries, in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslav countries, learn German as the first uh, foreign language. It is not because German is a particular beautiful language. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> um, it is nice for the protocol. <laughs> um, it is because they want to go to Austria and Germany. And once, if they get the golden ticket to come out, it is not easy for them. But they try and work hard. Um, they come here and they succeed. Mm, so how do we create possibilities? We have to make sure that they that we achieve that we achieve for them to have the same standards that we have here yeah thank you very much um i think that now we're ready to open up the discussion also to our guests so if anybody has a question from either from the zoom online format or from here live at the institute i would really welcome you to ask the question Yes, Gerhard. Here you go. Thank you. My name is Gerhard Machel of the Karl Renner Institute, one of the co-organizers of this event. Uh, thank you to, the, to our panelists tonight. Uh, there was a question on our Facebook site um, addressed to you, Vedran. Uh, the question concerns uh, Alexander Vucic and his role in the connection line with uh, Dodik and Putin. How do you see this? And my question, my personal question goes to Delara Burkhardt. Um, we already talked about the, uh, the lack of unanimity in the European Union. And um, I would like to touch upon the role of the Commissioner for Enlargement, Oliver Varelli. Varelli from Hungary. Um, yeah, how do you see, Delara, how do you see this problem and what can the European Parliament do about this? Do you make uh, pressure on the Commission to, yeah, to, to change um, the, the perspective? Thank you. Ms. Stellara, would you like to answer immediately to the question, or? Yes, uh, I, um, I can can start with that. Yes. I mean, what we have seen um, in the last um, months, if not years, is that the Commission always has been very hesitant when it comes to to concrete action and also to to put a spotlight on Bosn Bosnia Herzegovina. And of course, this is also connected to, to the commissioner, but I think it's a political problem, um, which is much more rooted also in the different perspectives of the different member states, because uh, we know that there are also different interests in the member states when it comes to, to, uh, to putting the situation um, on the table. So this is what I see also actually within the European Parliament, where we have forces um, in the conservative right a part of the parliament that um, that have an own political let me be frank about that have an own political agenda when it comes um, to the future of the western balkans and this as um, the question of uh, foreign policy itself is something that is has to be decided on unanimously in, in the council this is something that is really blocking also european action in that sense and as a parliament i think we have the responsibility to deblock this and to truly also come to the point on what 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 um, a European action or also action to the perspectives of the uh, integration of the Western Balkan mean in that sense. And of course, we are making pressure, and um, we try uh, for for several weeks now to to have a, a new resolution also coming up in the European Parliament. We had some some. Um, 
discussions within um, the delegation, but we haven't had a resolution on the current situation yet, also because it was um, impossible um, um, with some parts of the parliament to uh, to talk um, about uh, the concrete steps that need to, to be made. So um, I, I, I kind of... I mean, it's my it's my um, it's my first mandate in the parliament. I'm only there for three years, and I'm trying to to kind of find ways within our delegation, within the possibilities we have as parliamentarians, to to kind of break this um, this blocking we are seeing in the council um, and in the commission by um, by thinking about new ways how we can also directly address those because um, Adnan, I have to say I was really, really touched by what you have said with all the desperation also on the question what what would come if a Dodik is not there because this is a question I am faced um, there a lot. And you know what I what I strongly believe is and this is what we have to strengthen as, as parliamentarians um, the, the body and the soul of a democracy of a resilient society is always the people that that are there, and I can I can understand. I mean, I I, I haven't been, I only have been in, in the region uh, three times. But in every talk I had, the the problem was that those who fight for democracy and who fight for a perspective or for a European perspective haven't had any positive reactions or any. Um, signs of solidarity coming from the European institutions um, only um, as, as, as strong as it should have had been. So this is, I think, the problem. If there's no, um, no reaction on what is happening on the ground, why, why should you be motivated to fight something for it? And I can understand young people who, who believe in the European future of Bosnia-Herzegovina to come um, and maybe try to, to work here and have per build up perspectives on their own here because they don't see it there because they are believers in democracy and um, a rule of law and they don't see it happening in their country. So this is what, what I think um, is, is our role as parliament now. Not only um, putting or showing the, the same routines we have seen for, for years, but to also build new bridges be between democracies, between people. Um, and this is what um, what I think um, as a parliament we, we need to strengthen. Unfortunately, um, we couldn't, uh, my, my colleague Andrea Schida, and, and we, we wanted to come to the region to, to start this also now, especially in this uh, situation, um, but um, we, we had to postpone that. But I, I think this is the way we have to go. We have to um, to go new paths and and not um, always excuse the European inaction with anonymity between the member states, but really come into to action when it comes to that. So, and um, this is why we I think we have to find new creative roles, and of course the the role of the Commission and the Council has been a blocking one in that sense. the connection between yes uh, I mean first of all quite emotionally and straightforward I mean uh, I, I despise this trio uh, Dodik, Vucic and, and, and Putin I mean this, th there are so many similarities in, in, in what they are what they represent uh, but that's on an emotional level uh, on, on, when it comes to, to facts I mean uh, uh, what we have seen uh, in the last decade is basically Serbia being the most, one of the most autocratizing uh, states uh, worldwide. Uh, so basically, Vucic and his regime, uh, which only can, this can be described as, as authoritarian or in the best possible way as a liberal, but this is, I think, this is a straightforward uh, small copy of what Putin uh, has brought to another level, but uh, what. Alexander Vucic is trying to copy here with all these coercion and repression and co-optation and control of the society and control of the media, uh, etc. And with, with the same rhetorics to a certain degree, uh, referring to historical facts and dreaming about the Serbian world, whatever it is, uh, in 2022. Uh, but this is one fact. The second fact, uh, quite important here, that Vucic so far has been able to sit on several chairs at the same time. As I mean, we have so many chairs here, and he will probably be the only one uh, able to move between all of them and sit with all, on all of them uh, within 10 seconds. Uh, and that, that has been a kind of a geopolitical and, and foreign policy strategy so far. So, a bit with China, 
uh, hugging uh, Angela Merkel, visiting Putin, taking pictures with uh, Erdogan, celebrating, uh, um, hugging or having barbecue with the former Austrian Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, quite interesting. Uh, so that was the strategy so far. But now I think uh, uh, Vucic finds himself in a, in a, in a terrible situation. So now, I mean, there is a lot of pressure. He had a meeting today uh, with ambassadors from the Quint. He uh, is facing a terrible pressure uh, to go in, into line in with, this, with, with sanctions of the European Union. Uh, that's where the European Union has to be uh, quite straightforward and outspoken. Uh, at the same time, he feels the pressure coming uh, from all possible sides, from Russia. Uh, I mean, there is a strong internal part of the public. There is. The, uh, now the Speaker of the Parliament, Ivica Dacic, who is with his party strongly on the Russian side, uh, he knows that Republican subs can put in the structures are on the side of, the, of, of Putin. And, and we know that, that Sir, uh, Russia has managed to deploy a lot of, uh, of, of different layers of, of its presence uh, throughout Serbia, be it secret services, be it uh, uh, possibility to operate on, in terms of producing information and uh, creating a narrative, uh, economic pressure through gas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's 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 right now a kind of a uh, defining moment for for Vucic's future. I mean, uh, just now to to opting out of this kind of a Europe, European moment, uh, which he might try to do, but because I don't think that he has this kind of a strong. Uh, deep connection to Putin as, as some others might have. So he's quite pragmatic about many issues and he's also about this one. Uh, but at the, end, at the other hand side, I mean, the overwhelming put pressure that Putin is putting on the table is so strong that he will try to navigate. Uh, I don't think uh, how he can manage. Uh, and just to finish, I mean, it's quite clear. I mean, Dodik, without the support from Serbia, from different layers of the structure of, this, of Serbia, but also by Vucic, by Vucic will not be able to uh, exercise this pressure on the, on the Bosnian state institutions. Uh, uh, the same goes for the Croats, with Chovic and, and without the support from, from Zagreb, uh, it will be a different story. Uh, nevertheless, and, and I mean, it's always, it was a good also to listen to Adi and to, to his visions, even if I, at the beginning, Adi, I don't uh, agree with your uh, a view of, of, of telling and, and listing right now at this very moment as what has achieved that has been achieved in Bosnia, but this is a different story we might want to discuss privately. Uh, but I do agree that we need something that's capturing the imagination of the people. And this is where uh, Vucic, Dodik and Putin and all these guys come in again. I mean, we have to be uh, quite, quite, uh, quite uh, outspoken about the fact that Vucic is not Serbia, even though he pretends to be uh, Serbia. Dodik is not entire uh, population of the Republic of Srpska, even though he does uh, uh, or he creates that kind of type of a narrative. Putin, in the very end, despite all the pressure and coercive force and repression, is not Russia. I mean, we even see today, now in the evening, some people in some cities of Russia trying to go out despite the highest uh, possible pressure that they are experiencing from the authorities to protest against the war. And, and I mean, that will be a situation evolving. So we, we have to underline what we have. We have to differentiate uh, and we have to, uh, to, 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 to look into, in, into basically beyond the narrative that is now presented right now. And I mean, in Serbia, Serbia right now, for example, is, is going into the elections. Uh, Vucic feels a pressure due to these uh, uh, protest movements uh, uh, on the streets of Belgrade and other cities uh, in, in, in the context of environmental change. Uh, he, for the first time, backed up, backed, uh, basically backed up, and, 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 and needed to make some kind of uh, 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 give some concession, confessions, concessions to the to the protesters. Uh, there is a new political party in Belgrade, or in, on the on the national level, called Moramo. We have to. Uh, so there there is a, a kind of a movement here within Serbia, which might also trigger some possible movements heading towards the Bosnian election. But yet again, obviously, uh, we need to ask this, this question that Adi also asked, what is the new that we uh, can put into the place capturing the imagination of the people? And that's not so easy. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the discussion and I want to encourage uh, the colleague from the European Parliament as I have been for many years in a similar position like you to, to engage you to in, in the region because I think uh, the Parliament can play a role, especially the personalities can play a role if they have a, a strong uh, position. I want to come back to Adi, what he said about, uh, this is also maybe in some connection of course to the European institutions, what he said that European Union should do, because I very much in favor of starting negotiations uh, with uh, uh, North Macedonia and Albania, but I agree that's not enough uh, for those countries who are not uh, directly involved. So maybe you can a bit uh, extend what, what your idea is. There's this idea of, of a stage accession process that means that all countries are involved in some step-by-step -step process in order to bring them in and in order also to force them to come to a decision so that Mr. Vucic, Vucic for example, would have to decide, yes, I am in the process and not only, uh, you know, yes, in princ principle, yes. No, they have to be a stronger engagement. But, but maybe you have other ideas because I think very much uh, a stronger engagement in the region is necessary but uh, it's still not easy to find. And of course, still the question is open because it's not only the commissioner from Hungary, it's the prime minister of Hungary, depends if he will be re-elected, who is very active in promoting his model, together with Mr. Vucic uh, and some others even, his model of, uh, of uh, illiberal democracy. So I think uh, the EU has to put another vision, uh, and I fully uh, say also another narrative, because what Putin did not start with military, he started with a narrative about Ukraine being part of the big Russia and have no right for self-determination. Uh, so I think, again, we need a stronger narrative of the European Union for the whole region and inside this region, and of course for Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thank you, Hannes. Yes, please. Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, maybe just very quickly because we also got a, a question uh, on Facebook from Gudrun Kramer, which is a, a quite clear question, because she asked about the Open Balkan Initiative. If this is hindering European Union integration, what is your opinion, or if it's, if it's uh, um, actually doing the opposite? And thanks a lot for your interesting insights. I appreciate it. Thank you. So I think maybe... Adi would be the right person to answer the question from Gudrun Kramer. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, maybe first to answer to Hannes, I mean, we had uh, these discussions. I think that what would be necessary at this uh, moment is uh, something very quickly also uh, during the French presidency uh, to be agreed as an offer to the Western uh, Balkans that keeps the goal of the EU, full EU membership uh, on the table, but that understands that discussing such an issue at the moment with everything that was would happen uh, would risk dividing, uh, dividing the EU would provide unnecessary, potentially unnecessary burden, that something around an interim step uh, needs to be uh, agreed and offered to the Western Balkans. Uh, my opinion is that it has to be something that has already been tried, that has already worked, uh, not uh, coming up with some kind of a new model uh, of an integration that could then again be seen as, as an alternative to, to, to full membership in, in the EU, not something that would, you know, take years and years to think about it, to develop, to think about lessons learned. Uh, and it needs to be something that's going to be offered to all six countries, from Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, Montenegro and uh, Serbia. Because the last thing we want is to see Albania and North Macedonia opening accession talks and then becoming like Montenegro and uh, Serbia, which in the current accession process uh, is, is, likely, uh, is, is likely to happen. So our proposal has been still is to offer Western Balkans to join the single market in the way that Austria, Finland, uh, Sweden have joined in the 1990s, first single market, then, uh, then as a second step or as a last step uh, full uh, membership uh, in, in the EU. It's a vision that uh, would uh, 
allow countries in the Western Balkans to uh, economically bridge the gap, start bridging the gap with the EU. It will it would create uh, circumstances for borders between the countries to become uh, invisible or less visible, but also between the EU and uh, and and the region. And it would be something that is on the path towards the full uh, EU. Uh, membership. And I think if we look at the experience of the transport community that already exists between the Western Balkans and the EU, it's also something that the EU 27 can agree on. And it's something that at the same time was offered to Kosovo and Bosnia-Herzegovina and Montenegro and uh, Serbia. So if a, a model that existed in 1990s uh, with the experience of the transport community could be offered to the Western Balkans, I think it would it would send a strong signal that uh, if you join the sanctions against Russia, if you work on rule of law reforms, if you work on on your own democracy, there is a chance that you can be part of the of the of the well state of of of, of progress uh, that exists uh, inside the EU. In that sense, any regional economic integration process and cooperation, uh, in my opinion, can only work can only contribute to the stability of the region if it's uh, if it's linked to to further integration with the EU. If we go back to CEFTA and if we go back to initial regional integration and cooperation in economic uh, terms in 2005, 2006, 2007, it was directly linked to the stabilization and association agreements. And if you go back and talk to people who were part of both processes, you will know that CEFTA was never their goal. CEFTA was never that was uh, that they were enthusiastic about. Most of them wanted the SAA uh, and get closer to the EU. And then as part of that, they also were part of CEFTA. So if we talk today about the open Balkans, of course, we uh, about common regional market, all of them can only succeed if all six are together. And if it's linked to something uh, with, uh, with the EU. So uh, at the moment for the common regional market on any type of regional integration of economy, we need something that's similar to the SAA uh, in uh, in the mid to 2000s. And I think in that sense, a single market membership uh, could, uh, could, could, could be uh, could be that and could could offer then a, a change in dynamics and also a, a potential change in in the in the relationship between the EU and and the, and the Western Balkans. Thank you, Adi, very much. I would like to turn to Elise, maybe to ask two questions about the role of the youth, especially what is the youth activism in um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and especially maybe in Austria. There were some protests in front of the Hofburg, if I remember correctly, several weeks ago. Um, in the, how how would you prescribe the role of the youth diaspora in Austria, and maybe also in other countries, but especially in Austria when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina? Thank you for the question, Luca. Um, well, first of all, the, the diaspora was very worried about all of um, what was happening in Bosnia and what is happening in Bosnia. And I think the, the role of the diaspora is very important because firstly, we don't want to be another generation that knows war in their home countries. Um, what is very hard as well, we don't want our parents, our grandparents, our teachers, our friends to be witnesses of another war. They have yet to heal from the last one. And that we connected um, with people because I got active with my sister and a dear friend of ours, Dennis Miskic, who is in Srebrenica right now and he's watching. Hi, Dennis. Um, we got active because what we realized is in the years of the war, there was no diaspora. There were no people like us who could act, voice their concerns, try to build up political pressure, inform people. So the role of the diaspora is very important. Um, firstly, to because there's so many people, I think, in Bosnia who, who just resigned, who take the political crisis, crisis after crisis, we talked about them in the last uh, hour and a half, they just take it as given, as something that goes along the, or is in the Yugoslav identity, but it is not. Um, it is people 
like Vucic and Milorad Dodik, who do not represent the whole country, as um, Vedran said. Um, and there are so many young people organizations that we talk to who are so motivated to, to change the things, uh, to change things and to change the status quo. Um, and so I think it's just important that we keep up um, voicing their concerns and build up political pressure. And the second question was about the demonstrations. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, together with the Bosnian youth, initiated a protest in Vienna. And we were quite unsure how it would go because our community is not used to having demonstrations. Um, the only big demonstration we have together is on 11th of July, where we remember the, um, the genocide in, Sre in Srebrenica. And it was a very positive feedback. We had politicians there and it was really important just for our community to connect, to show that we care, that politicians here care, um, that it's not just the people who are, who are victims of this war and concerned with this war that care about these issues. Thank you very much, Elise. Maybe we should focus a bit on the positive side and what will happen in the future. I think that it is really important. Ah, we have a question in the audience. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mirjana Tomic, and I uh, did cover the war in Bosnia as a journalist, so I know something about a war. And there was a diaspora, and the diaspora took sides, ethnic sides. So you're not the first diaspora. Let's start with that. Uh, and, this, uh, and the diaspora took very, very strong. Sometimes the diaspora was more nationalist than the people on the ground. Uh, that's one uh, uh, point. The second point is, uh, Alida spoke about corruption. And uh, from what I have understood tonight, the only disruptor is Dodik, and then Vucic, and then uh, uh, Putin. How about, is it Begovic family? Uh, how about, about their corruption? How about, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 is there only one disruptor in that country, or there are uh, three disruptors? That's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I would, first of all, let Vedran answer your question, but we were talking mostly about the current crisis, which was in some way produced by Milorad Dodik and not by Izet Begovic or other members or politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I think Vedran would be happy to answer you the question. I mean, th thanks for the questions, but it's it's really important to clarify. I mean, first of all, obviously, on the question of diaspora. I mean, diaspora has been nationalized and has been lining in with uh, with, with many leaders. Uh, I mean, it has been under the influence of, of of the narratives from the home countries, obviously. But at the same time, what Elise was referring to uh, is, I think, a, a, a new moment in, in within the diaspora which we need to recognize. And this is basically young people. I mean, Elise, you are uh, in the early twenties. Dennis is in the early twenties. Uh, and there is a, some kind of a sense of of, of uh, urgency uh, where they want to uh, come together. They do and they did uh, uh, come together in the last few weeks. And I do think that that can change uh, our dynamics when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina in general. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the, the whole crisis uh, is, 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 is a disaster for the country itself. But then on the other hand side, if we just take another lenses and glasses, uh, there was a huge mobilization of diaspora. Uh, yes, I mean, it might be that there are more Bosniaks within it, but there are more other that don't care about the national identity. There are so many that are simply dedicated and supporting uh, fundamental values that we all share as Europeans, which is then liberalism, which is openness, we want to travel, we want to live a normal life, if you just if you just draw the line. And I mean, uh, regarding Dodik Vucic and, 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 and Putin, I mean, this is just responding to the question, uh, that was a, a kind of an answer, but I mean, it's quite obvious that this is not the whole story in the Western Balkans and, and the dynamics in Bosnia, and I have been writing so much about that one since 1995, was an ethno-political one where the three sides 
play the role of communicating vessels. Uh, and I mean, right now, the whole debate about the change of the electoral law was very much triggered by Chovic and by uh, a, a, a horrible support that he is getting from a nominal social democrat in Croatia, who luckily today switched the sides and, and is now condemning the, the, the Russian aggression uh, uh, quite openly and strongly, which I was, I mean, asking myself what, what, what line he is going to take, because the last few weeks he was a bit, you know, uh, uh, on a different side, uh, uh, and 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 it's quite quite clear that behind the uh, the ethno-political narrative and discourse is a rhetoric uh, on all three sides. Uh, this ethno-clientelistic corrupt structures we are basically uh, mushrooming, uh, and I mean it's quite clear that SDA is controlling huge parts of the Bosnian canton. But yet again, I mean what we need to say right now, and this is the the, the quest for differentiation. It was not Izetbegovic that triggered this crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's not Izetbegovic. That's not even Chovic. I mean he's trying to do, uh, but it's not even Chovic that has basically has uh, attacked the sovereignty and the constitution of the Bosnia that severely, uh, and this is a, a, a difference. This is a difference. I mean, I always uh, tend to say, and this is what I uh, just today in the morning when I woke up, or yesterday, uh, uh, said to, to N1, I, I think was a, the, the, the regional TV station where I was yesterday uh, giving an interview about the situation in the Balkans, and I, I think it's important to say that not all sides are always having the same uh, or burden or basically the same uh, can be can be blamed in this, the same way for the for the situation that we have i mean we have i mean it's it's also not like the wars in the yugoslav in the yugoslav uh, ex yugoslavia in the 90s uh, it's not that the croats and the serbs and the bosniaks and the albanians are all the same it's not that the ukrainians and the russians today uh, are responsible uh, uh, in the same way for the situation that we have right now we have to Call the spade a spade, uh, and 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 be quite straightforward. I mean, here again, I mean, it's today it's Putin's and Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Uh, yesterday it was Dodik's attack on the institution of the Bosnian Herzegovina, and not Izetbegovic. And that's something that I just keep repeating before, because we need to correct the narratives that are partly spreading around. Uh, Luca, if I can jump in, of course, yes, if it's please. possible. Um, I think if there's something I'm, if, if there's one thing that I would like to, to, to share with you when it comes to criticism to all three or all four uh, major politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's their detachment from the reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Maybe with that, I can also explain to veterans and some, to some others that were skeptical about me sharing at the beginning the successes or the, 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 the dramatic changes of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think that the main politicians, are totally detached from what the reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina today is. We have been captured by discussion how the three members of the presidency are being elected at the same time when uh, across the country, from one, uh, from one municipality to another, you have enormous number of uh, people who live in municipalities where their ethnic group is not in majority, or where they elect mayors, for example, in, in Doboj, even when Bosniaks have candidates that are uh, representing uh, some of the Bosniaks party, they were uh, prone to, to, to elect uh, or to vote for, for a Serb candidate because he was good uh, for what they thought was their uh, everyday life. In the municipality of Varesh, HDZ, a Croat candidate is being elected in a majority Bosniak uh, municipality because he's less corrupted than as the A candidate and because as HDZ candidate uh, ahead of the elections, he went on and paid tribute to the victims that were killed by the Croat, uh, Croat soldiers during the the war and he recognized the, the, the atrocities that happened there. So when I talk about uh, medicinal agency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, I'm talking about the reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina today. Serbs, Bosniaks, Croats and others work in joint institutions. Uh, reality is, is, is changed, but is not reflected by the debates and by the policies that are being uh, championed or driven by, by, the, by the main actors. Uh, and uh, yes, corruption plays a major role in that because with this kind of narrative, they manage to, I mean, they manage to, to keep themselves in, in, in power. That's why I believe we need to stress this 
uh, other or new reality of Bosnia Herzegovina 26 years after the the the, the war, because I think policy uh, should reflect uh, more and more this uh, new reality and should then lead to improve, improvements of, of everyday lives of citizens of Bosnia Herzegovina. Thank you very much, Adi. Adi, just a sentence, not to be mis misunderstood. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I totally share the fact that Bosnia today is a different one than in, in, in 1995, in a much better country probably. But I just think the timing of telling this kind of a narrative is probably not the best. I think we, what we face, if, I mean, really speaking about today, and I want to speak about today because this is one of the defining moments for the European history, uh, and having in mind what uh, Dordic and Maslitsa and, and the others are now telling, I think... Uh, uh, having in mind these this fierce attacks on the sovereignty of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the grave danger uh, that, could, that could hit uh, Bosnia and the Bosnian people, I do think that we have uh, to create a narrative of urgency for the European Union and for the West to react Really, deploying forces, yes, go and deploy the forces to Brčko and, and put 500 more, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and do something about that one. And then, I mean, then I, I totally come back to what you argue. Then what we need to deconstruct is basically this kind of a narrative that the three politicians that are totally detached or the three political ethno-clientalistic groups have been uh, promoting, we have to uh, destruct it. Uh, we have to present a narrative of another Bosnia which is so much present. I mean, we all the time share the stories of our friend Samir and his fight in Yaitse. Uh, we have uh, stories of the brave women of Khrushchev. We have the stories of so many people in so small communities. I mean, in my home city, Predor, NGOs and, and brave people standing up uh, and, and doing a wonderful and important job. I mean, there is a sense, and I always argue, there is a sense of of, of commonality, there is a sense of solidarity in the Western Balkans, there is a sense of a common sense. I mean, we all, at the end of the day, want to live a normal life, and we all died during the corona crisis uh, because of Dodiks and all the Vucic and, 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 and Izetbegovic uh, and his wife's uh, uh, running the hospital and the University Clinical Center and, and Chovic. So this is the moment, uh, but right now, uh, feeling the sense of the, of the global, but also local and uh, regional urgency, I really do think that now the the the, the West and the EU has 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 to promote right now a, a, a different narrative. This is where we probably a bit disagree uh, uh, in 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 emphasizing basically the whole situation. But in the substance, I think we we totally agree. If I can just jump in just to to, to reflect. Uh, the issue that I don't know, maybe it's different in Vienna and in Austria, but the further you are away from Bosnia and Herzegovina, more people have the vision of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a country that's very weak at the state level and that is deeply divided in three mono ethnic territories. And that when you talk about what are the dangers of a plan and a narrative by Miller Dodik, they don't see how that can. Uh, be reflected in everyday reality because in their heads Bosnia Herzegovina is divided in three mono-ethnic territories and there's no one or there's very few people who are in danger by the plan that that Dodik has and in that sense I think it's important to uh, re-emphasize and explain how that over 200,000 non-Serbs today in Republika Srpska are afraid of the plan and potential consequences of of that uh, plan, and I think that's 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 where 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 my uh, where my stance is at at the moment. Let's put it like that. Thank you very much, Adi. Before moving on to the closing remarks of, of remarks of our panel, I would first of all like to thank very much to our cooperation partners, the Karl Rana Institute and the Austrian Institute for International politic for international affairs. And to move on to the closing remarks, I would like, first of all, maybe to start with uh, Mrs. Delara Burkat. What do you see coming in the future, in the next years? What will be the developments? What can the EU do? What do you expect from the EU to do? I mean, as it has been shared in the beginning, I think uh, the current situation with Ukraine and the overall question of um, how a European security security architecture will look uh, in the future, there is, um, I think, a, a new room to maneuver when it comes to, to have a concisive European um, approach uh, to the Western Balkan. Um, I mean, before um, 
I mean, Michael Roth was quoted with with um, especially using also the the current situation in addressing that the question of, um, or the approach uh, to to the accession of the Western Balkan countries needs to be now put on the table, and we already see reactions um, in the council, especially from Hungary and Croatia, who want to again block um, possible sanctions um, to. Uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. So we, I think, the the pressure on those who are blocking right now, it's going to rise when the the question of the overall European security um, architecture will come. So um, also, although it would not have been the vision of how I want the the question of the Western Balkans being uh, put on the European level, I think this is where we have a no, new window of opportunity to also um, build bridges uh, in that sense. So I think there is a um, there is a um, responsibility and the uh, um, room to maneuver and to push uh, for for concrete action. So this is what I um, what I would um, say in this sense. But also maybe um, if I'm allowed, I would like to to share a long time vision which I just heard uh, recently from uh, from Peter Hugelbrink from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Sarajevo, which I really liked um, in an overall approach because I think we are coming on a point where. Um, not only the question of the um, uh, Western Balkan integration of the European, but the European project itself is put into a test. And we also have to ask our question, where are we heading as a European Union, uh, in a sense, especially with the changing environment? And um, Peter was um, describing that um, a democratic, uh, resilient bosnia herzegovina governor could be really like a Role model and the vision for for European integration, if it it if it works out, because it's a multi a multi ethnic country, and if um, Bosnia Herzegovina can show how um, how unity and how um, peace um, can function in a multi ethnic country like this, it can be a role model for for the European integration or the further European integration. Talking here as a European federalist, I think this is a, a long time vision where maybe also um, um, pro European actors in Bosnia Herzegovina can um, find um, motivation from to, to to also be this role model and to fight for a civil society that is. Um, able to to transform also the country in that sense. So this is uh, something uh, maybe you uh, you like this picture too, um, but I think this is something where you could where you could take inspiration and motivation from uh, when it comes to talk about the future of the European Union with the Western Balkans in it. So this would be my my hope for the next week that we can uh, next weeks and months that we can push for there and also of course that we uh, finally can um, overcome the blockage on the on the sanction which i heard um, from the council meeting last week that we already had uh, again hungary uh, hungary and croatia blocking uh, a possible sanctions pa package um so um this is the reality but um i want to t to finish with a positive vision also Thank you very much, Mrs. Bokat. So maybe to continue to Adi immediately. Adi, how do you perceive the, the, the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially also you talked about this common vision maybe for the Western Balkans and EU integration. So how do you see when you look to the future? Let me put it like this. I think that the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina was dangerous even before what we've seen unfolding in Ukraine. Uh, in the past 24 uh, hours, because what Milar Dodik and the ruling coalition in Banja Luka have set out at, as their plan, and what they, have with concrete steps, started to implement, uh, amounts to collapsing institutional and constitutional architecture of Bosnia and Herzegovina and introducing both legal political and potentially security, uh, instability and chaos to not just Republika Srpska and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but to the uh, entire region. This what happened today or in the past 24 hours made things even more dangerous because in today's Europe, politicians talking about historical injustices, talking about uh, new borders and taking tanks and uh, weapons to carve out new new uh, uh, borders have uh, 
have become a reality of our uh, everyday life. Uh, in that sense, the urgency of Europe and the world and us uh, uh, to react uh, uh, to what, hap- what is happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina has never been uh, more important or uh, more uh, urgent uh, in uh, that sense. Uh, when it comes to the instruments and uh, 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 at our disposal that we have, and that some have been uh, mentioned before, from deploying more forces, uh, using sanctions, uh, all of that uh, have their place in making sure that the EU and the world show their stance uh, in making sure that uh, those uh, ar- uh, around Dodik and Dodik himself think twice about what uh, they uh, want to do. But in order for us in the medium term and in the long term, uh, create a circumstances where vision of Bosnia and Herzegovina and of the region as, as a region of liberal democracies, prosperous economies that are contributing to the European uh, security uh, architecture, we will need to work seriously on uh, reinforcing or uh, reinventing uh, European integration uh, for the region. I want to just underline, in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, even if it, if, there is, if it finds itself under attack by Milorad Dodik and the group of people in his ruling coalition that have instruments from police uh, to uh, resources, financial and others to create a lot of troubles in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There's a lot in Bosnia and Herzegovina that is, uh, that is worth defending. From uh, institutions that we have built, from multi-ethnic character that we've managed to some extent uh, to restore to much of the energy among young people, among uh, businesses that are export-oriented, that have profited from regional integration, from integration uh, with the EU, and that provide a very solid basis for us to work with if we become serious about integrating Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region uh, inside the the, the, the EU uh, and uh, uh, giving it a chance to uh, do what some countries like from Estonia to uh, Romania or Bulgaria have done in the past 20 to 30 years. Thank you very much, Adi. Now let's turn to Vedran for your closing remarks. Is there possible that a reconciliation will finally happen in the Western Balkans and so that maybe also no further crises will develop in Bosnia and Herzegovina and developing itself to a beautiful multi-ethnical state? Everything is possible. I mean, just just two weeks ago, no one thought that that uh, Putin is going to invade in uh, Ukraine, but he did. Uh, and uh, obviously, I mean, when we think about the uh, future of any of our countries in real utopian terms, I mean, obviously, we all of dream, dream of prosperous countries, of of best possible countries for our kids and and for for our friends and families. Uh, that's quite clear. Uh, but uh, and we need to keep up that kind of a hope, that kind of a, of, a, of a vision of real utopia, because this is the, the, the engine, basically, for working today, to achieving it tomorrow. Uh, but first things first, uh, and, and, and today it's far, far away to speak about, you know, picking up on the uh, reconciliation process and speeding up that process. That's, uh, that's now uh, uh, in the background. Uh, but I think, uh, I mean, three points. The first one is, uh, I think we cannot take peace for granted. Uh, I mean, many generations, uh, also in Austria, uh, in the Western Europe, uh, grew up uh, believing that the peace is something that we can take for granted. And now I, today, I mean, I met a few of my neighbors uh, picking up my kids from the kindergarten, from the school, and they, I mean, they, they are shocked, and then they, they even can't understand that this is happening, because now, I mean, when, if Russia extends uh, its control of the Ukraine to over the western borders, uh, then for Alberg uh, will be uh, uh, basically far away uh, than the border between Austria and, 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 and the Russian-controlled territories. Uh, and this is a new momentum. This is something completely new. I mean, the wars in the Yugoslavia, in the Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia in the 90s, yes, they were horrible. 
So many people died and killed and refugees. But yet, I mean, it was not a nuclear power, that was not Russia, that was limited uh, to a certain region, uh, uh, not with that kind of a profound impact on the world order which this one is having. So I think we can take peace for granted, which at, at the same time means you now have to think twice how to continue with the NATO en enlargement, what to do about Kosovo. Now, I mean, now it's time to pressure the five states, at least few of them, to, un to recognize Kosovo to lift the visa uh, story. I mean, you know, you need to make bolder steps uh, right now. Opening up the negotiations, obviously, that's the first step. Uh, I think the EU uh, needs to deliver first on, on what it has been promising for so long. I mean, that needs to be done, checked. Uh, and then we can, what Adi was alluding to, then we need to, to go into a bolder vision of what the uh, uh, what the next integrational step can be and what the Europe uh, uh, is able to offer. So that's, that's, that's I think, the, uh, the, the, the series of the next steps that, that I think will be necessary. Uh, when it comes to, 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 to Bosnia uh, and to the vision of Bosnia and the Bosnian society, uh, I just want to, to underline why, once again, I mean, even in the uh, darkest hours, I mean, when, when I was confronted with the war in 1992, as a leader was. Uh, I mean, you all, we all went through all possible types of situations. Uh, uh, we all uh, jumped into depression holes and, and came back fighting, becoming refugees, building up a new life. And if there is something that the war teaches you, that there will be a moment when the war will come to an end. Uh, uh, there will be a moment and uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, developments around Ukraine going on and, and in Russia where people at the end of the day, need to stop the war, then you need to open that kind of a dialogue. And, and, and this is the moment where you need uh, to create a kind of a order uh, afterwards. I mean, in Bosnia, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, in, in so many countries, I do think that one of the results of this 30 years of, of end of history, which was never re true end of history, but one of the results is basically that we do have a strong underlying notion of what a normal life means, what democracy can be, what freedom is supposed to be, what justice uh, is supposed to be, at least in a theoretical level. And this notion, uh, if it is, I mean, despite uh, of, uh, or neglecting now the, the, the fact that uh, Putin directly is attacking that kind of a vision of our lives, but I think this is a notion that is also shared by many Russians, that's obviously shared by huge parts of the population of the Ukraine, and I think this is an underlying common sense in, in, in the Western Balkans, in Bosnia, uh, Bosnia too, and we have to build up on that one to reinvent what we dreamt of uh, in 1989, 1990 and continue on that path. Thank you very much, Vedr. Now to turn to the last participant and to the last closing remark. There is still a Facebook question which is open, which would be perfectly suited for Elise to answer in her closing remark. The question is, how can we strengthen the young people and help them to replace the old leaders in the political parties in the Western Balkans and in, the, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular? So, Elise. Thank you, oh, well, and thank you for the question. Um, last week, uh, the Austrian Association for European Politics that Vedran moderated, a colleague said, said a sentence, um, which is very suitable for this um, question, I think. Um, it was a panel discussion on the youth, on the cost of our youth in Pristina. And what she said was, we have to give the youth the right to be listened to. And I think this is what we have to do in the Bosnian case as well and in all of the Western Balkan countries. Because in some ways, the youth, we are experts for our own questions. We have to be encouraged to, to voice our concerns, um, to, to build unions, to, to fight together for a bigger cause. And we also have to think long term because these politicians in power, no matter who they are, no matter in which country, they lack the long term visions. They think about their gains. And we have to think in the long term about cultural exchange, for example. Um, my mother, 
she told me um, oftentimes that she went to Belgrade with her dad to go shopping, how beautiful Belgrade was. I mean, today we have people who live in Banja Luka who have never been to Sarajevo. There is no highway from Belgrade to Sarajevo. It's a distance of under 300 kilometers and it takes you more than five hours to get there. This is a problem. And maybe we can start by by these practical solutions, may it be infrastructural. Um, and then we will we will have this cultural exchange, maybe more, but that would encourage it. And then we would, or we could take a step away from these ethno-nationalist narratives for the youth as well. Because I mean, frankly, today, if you wanna have a good job in Bosnia or the Western Balkans today, you have to join a party. If you join a party, you will have a good job, you, you will have a good future. So there's no alternative and we have to create those alternatives. Thank you very much, Alice. I would like to thank to all the panelists who were participating, especially also Alida, uh, she had to leave a bit earlier. Thank you very much for this panel. I think it was really important and really interesting to hear this. Thank you for the guests who showed up also at the Institute and to our cooperation partners. And at the end, I would like to say that I think for all of us, our hopes and prayers are with the people and the citizens of Ukraine. So I wish you all a good evening and see you soon.